Particularly is from the West, Hildegard Nocton uh, as well. And um, you know, we're a government for the entire country. Um, and that's a very important point. And Green Party councillor Hazel Chu has been elected as the Lord Mayor of Dublin. She's urging the council to be united in the coming months after the pandemic. The phrase, we're all in this together, has been said and practised many times in the past three months. I echo it here tonight, again tonight, since it is the unity and togetherness. That's it for now. More in an hour. News Talk Weather. Thanks to the AA. For great value van insurance, go online to theaa.ie. Cloudy tonight with more outbreaks of rain and drizzle, but some dry spells too. Some mist and fog developing as those westerly winds ease with overnight lows of 9 to 11 degrees. And now you're up to date on News Talk. Monday Night Rugby on Off The Ball with Vodafone, official sponsors of the Irish rugby team. Team of us, everyone in. Now, happy as ever to welcome Rory O'Connor of the Irish Independent to the show. Rory, how you doing? Hey, Joe, how's it going? Yeah, very well. So a few bits and bobs to get through with you. James Lowe, for instance, we're going to see him in an Irish jersey in November. I think people expected this from a long way off, but it's as close to official now as it will be. Yeah, he signed a, a, he's confirmed that he signed a three-year deal, uh, which was announced last week. Leinster have a policy. They don't um, confirm the, the durations of their deals. So we've had players coming out in ones and twos to let, let everyone know how long they're staying. And he came out today and did it. So he's signed up until the 2023 World Cup. And um, that's not really a surprise. He's been absolute quality since he got here. Um, whatever your views on the project player rule, and he's the last... You know, maybe not the last because there's two, you know, two young guys in Munster now, two props who probably will go on to or may go on to play for Ireland, who they got in. But the last kind of high profile of the project players under the three-year rule, he's going to add quality to the Ireland jersey. You know, he'll definitely get captain this November as long as he's fit. He won't be there in time if the Six Nations is concluded uh, on schedule in October. He'll he'll just miss that, so he won't be able. You know, Ireland won't have a marquee signing for the last two rounds of the Six Nations. But um, whatever structure November takes, um, Andy Farrell will have a new weapon in his armory in James Lowe. The image of maybe people in particular like Keith Earls or Jacob Stocktail or Andrew Conway on the bench or even Conway maybe out of the squad for James Lowe won't sit comfortably with lots of people suddenly come November. As you said, Lowe is the last of the three-year residency rule players. This will cause heat come November. There will be pieces in the paper criticising Andy Farrell for picking low. We'll be talking about it on the radio. I suspect, though, if the past is any kind of guide, the coach and the RFU will ride that out and they'll get what they see as the best 15 onto the pitch. I don't see an about turn on this situation in November. No, well, they signed them to play for Ireland. I yeah. mean, it's the same as any... You know, see, the standard, Bundyaki were recruited to play for Ireland, ultimately. You know, they they are assigned to play for the province for the three years and the province gets the, the huge benefit of them. And as with all of these cases, I don't like the rule, but I'd never criticise the individual for coming over and taking that opportunity. Mm. Um, James Lowe has been an excellent contributor for Leinster over the time that he's been there and he'll be an excellent contributor for Ireland, I think. You know, I think Bundy Aki and CJ Stander have won Grand Slams with Ireland. You know, CJ was probably up there amongst Ireland's best performers at the last World Cup. I mean, the you know they they're just doing what they they what's being asked of them by their employers. The criticism really should be of you know if you're going to criticise the whole thing, it should be the IRFU, and you know it, opportunistic slash cynical exploitation of of a of, of a law that um, you know I think is deeply flawed um, by going out and signing players to to play for Ireland. You know which you know probably undermines the spirit. Sorry, it doesn't probably. I think it undermines the spirit of the international game. Um, but it's gone now after James Lowe, Keenan Knox and Roman Salanoa, who are both at Munster now and may go on to play for Ireland in, in the next two or three years. Um, it's a five-year residency law and these cases, I think, will become fewer and I think people will be less critical of players. And I mean, I, again, I don't think players should be individually criticised for playing, you know, for doing this. I don't think it's I don't think it's on them really, but you know, if a player's come and spent five years here, it's probably more meritorious and it's it's more of a life commitment than three. Stockdale, Earls, Conway, Lowe, who starts? Um, it's a great question. Stockdale at the moment, Conway and Lowe are probably the two informed players. Um, Stockdale's had a rough eighteen months, but is probably the quality operator of the field. I mean, Earls. Is is still on a national contract, but is you know is is in the autumn of his career. Um, Stockdale, I think, will come back and will perform for Ireland again. But you know, if you think if you're only as good as your last game, you had a bit of a, 
a bad outing at Twickenham and it wasn't his, his first last his first bad game in the last little while. So um I mean I don't think Lowe can, can expect to come straight into the starting team and, and, and take take a spot. Um I think he'll have a little bit of work to do to prove himself. That'll add a bit of spice to the month I we may have two uh, Leinster v Munster games within three weeks in the Pro fourteen mm. if things shape up the way they look like they're 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 gonna shape up. So that adds a bit of spice to that. But at the moment, you know, I think Conway has been excellent. I think Larmer is, is the fullback. Um, you do have the option of, of shifting um, Jacob Stockdale into fullback. He's played quite well there for Ulster. Um, Lowe looks like he has everything that Ireland, you know, Ireland have been losing collisions on a, on a fairly alarming basis in their biggest games. Lowe will fix, well, you know, will add something to that collision winning part of the game. He's good in every department and he adds a bit of spark. So it's going to be hard to argue against them, but I'm sure those three, you know, quality operators will have, uh, will have something to say about it before they hand the jersey over to him and say good luck. Rory, you mentioned Leinster don't necessarily reveal how long a contract is. They yeah. announced 28 players that signed <laughs> contracts last week. So I'm sure you were busy. It would seem Fergus McFadden and Rob Carney are amongst them. So they will be staying on for the next couple of months anyway to finish out this season, but into next season. I'm sure everyone knows what I mean. Yeah, it's, it, I mean, it's a mark of how successful and how... Um, how much good news Leinster generate is that they just basically stockpile all their their um, contract announcements for for one date and, and kind of in a, you know a, a random date towards the end of the season. Obviously, it's different this year, but you know other other provinces when they lose a big game, suddenly the contracts are rolled out on the Monday to try and change the narrative. Leinster don't bother. Like one of those contracts, I believe, was signed in July 20, 2019. so they held off for. 11 months to to announce it so um in terms of mcfadden and, and carney they would have finished with leinster uh at the end of, in what tomorrow um then you know mcfadden is retiring carney has said he wants to continue but hasn't certainly hasn't announced it that he's got anything lined up but um it looks like both of their time in blue will come to an end uh depending on when they finish in either september and october depending on how leinster get on in in the european cup um, and will bow out after pretty glorious Leinster careers and Ireland careers. And it just remains to be seen whether Rob Kearney decides that he wants to go and pursue something in France or in Japan or in the USA or mm. wherever rugby could take him, because I'm sure he's no shortage of options. Um, but it looks like his time with, uh, with Leinster and with Ireland is, is up at this stage. You, so you mentioned how this season is going to finish out. We're adding layers to the schedule. Championship, Championship Cup uh, quarter final is penciled in for the weekend of the 17th of September, which includes Leinster Saracens semi-finals the weekend after, and then the final with presumably maybe Six Nations games in between. I don't know exactly, but the final... No, Pro, Pro 14. Be? Pro 14. The first two rounds of next season's Pro 14 will take place before the final of last season's Champions Cup. OK, so the final of the Champions Cup is 17th of October, and then potentially we have Six Nations? Then potentially Six Nations on the 24th and the 31st, I think. OK. And then we may have an eight-team tournament between the Six Nations, Fiji and Japan, which is currently the way the winds are, are shifting. But that is very much up in the air. World Rugby were supposed to confirm by tomorrow what November and October will look like. But there's, as ever with these things, there's pushback from the French and English clubs. It looks like, that. I think they've confirmed today to AFP that um, that's going to be kicked on for another two or three weeks into the middle of July. So we've no clarity on what the international scene will look like just yet. Yeah, there was meant to be a decision tomorrow, whether it was going to be revealed or not, I'm not sure, but World Rugby were going to decide all this tomorrow and it's been postponed. So clearly there's a lot going on behind the scenes. Like, for instance, I saw the French, usually it's a three-week uh, window in November. The French are looking for a six-week window in November and all of that, of course, without any of us knowing really if Southern Hemisphere teams can even travel. Yeah, I think what will happen is that the Rugby Championship will play off at that time when all of these Super Rugby competitions come to an end. So they'll be unwilling, and also that they have travel restrictions in place, which may mean they can't even do that, but um, they'll be unwilling to come north, which means that the Six Nations teams, who already have to finish two rounds, well, Ireland have, Ireland Italy have two rounds, everyone else has, has one round of Six Nations to finish before they get their money-spinning three or four tests. Um, and I, like, I can really understand where they're coming from in that, but they, you know, the clubs are also desperate for cash. Uh, unlike in Ireland, where the national team pays the bills, they don't have that system, so... You know, your Toulouse's, your Montpellier's, they need gate receipts just as much as everyone else. They need TV income, they need prize money, they need their players who they pay an awful lot of money to. Um, I was on a call with um, Leinster CEO Mick Dawson on Thursday and he said that, you know, to, to fans, and he, he described the kind of the way it was gone, they went about organising this as naive. It was kind of presented as a fait accompli to the clubs. 
and the clubs are too important to really you know go about it that way it needs to be completely inclusive it feels like we're having the same it's a bit like the GAA championship structures you can have this conversation over and over and over again mm. and it looks like we may just end up with the status quo and the exact same lines are about to announce that they're going to go ahead as planned in July and August which means that we're not going to see a shift next season but it, it's very messy and really you know you see the Premier League has been played you can see Super Rugby Aitarua uh, Australia is back this week you know rugby's coming back football's back other sports are coming back and rugby still doesn't have really a defined schedule for, for, for when it comes back. And that's kind of going to be a little bit damaging, I think. By the way, on Saracens, so Leinster extending the contracts to the likes of Fergus McFadden or Rob Carney, that's pretty straightforward business. Saracens, for obvious reasons, are an entire, in, in an entirely different situation next season. I was reading today, Brad Barrett, for instance, has signed a short-term contract, which will include the Leinster game. But then there's players like uh, George Cruz, certainly. I think Alex Good as well. Some of these players who are on the way out, are they sticking around to finish out the Champions Cup season? Can Saracens afford to keep them around? Do we know what kind of Saracens might rock up to Dublin? I think a lot of them will have left because I think most transfers went through uh, or are going through tomorrow because traditionally contracts finish on the 30th of June and start on the 1st of July. So the players that are going on loan for a season, um, there's a couple of them, um, they'll be gone. Uh, anyone who's like George Cruz, is, is, I'm almost certain, is gone. Uh, Lozowski's gone like the, uh, players of good calibre have left the club Barrett is obviously retiring so he can just pen a bit like Carney and McFadden in that he has nothing lined up for next season so he can pen uh, a short term deal mm. um, it sounds like a Toje de Vunipola's own Farrell are sticking around so I think they will have some quality on the pitch but certainly it's not going to be the same um, Cyrus's team that Leinster faced in the Champions Cup final uh, last year Yeah the latest I had today sorry I sprung that on you but the latest I had today was Farrell as you say Itoje, the Vunapolos are all staying. Elliot Daly's going to stay. Jamie George is going to stay. Liam Williams gone. Will Skelton gone. Yeah. The likes of Matt Gallagher to Munster. So it's weakened, but it's not totally bereft. But it's not the Saracens of last year, that's for sure. No, like that's the core of the England team. So we saw how good the Saracens reserves were when they came to Thoman Park in, in December and, and you know pushed Munster close and ultimately did for Munster's season by playing so well in, in bad conditions in Thomas Park. So they have the best academy in England as well as having the best first team. But it's it's a giant leap for those players to come in, albeit around a core of you know experienced winners, you know England players, Lions, gen, you know in a large part. But you know against Leinster, who you'd imagine are going to hit hit the ground running, who haven't been weakened at all. And it's going to be very, very difficult mm. uh, away from home. If, you know, at the Viva Stadium, albeit it might be behind closed doors, which you know would suit Saracens. But um, yeah, it's not the it's not the prospect that it once was. I'm sure that there's a belligerence to Saracens that will they produce something of a performance. But if you think those players were all here two, three years ago during the glorious 2018 uh, season, and they couldn't put it up to Leinster at their best, mm. and you know they they've been considerably weakened since then. The latest on the pay cut situation. As I understand it, uh, BDO, I think I was reading Kieran Medler on behalf of the uh, Players Union, went in and had a look at the IRFU books, did an analysis of where the union is and talks are set to resume on uh, Wednesday. Now, I'm not sure if having looked at the books, the Players Union now accept that a pay cut is imminent and there's, there's no alternative or whether they feel emboldened to say it's not necessary. Have we heard either way? No, um, that I don't know. My feeling is that the players are willing to accept some form of a cut, that they understand that the RFU has taken a massive hit. And coming into this, before they even saw the books, they accepted that, look, like everyone else, pretty much in Irish society, things are you know things have been hit hard. They're going to have to play play ball to some degree. They were blindsided by the, the number, 20%, coming out in the media before um, they were ever shown the books, before that the... Before the um, discussions started before it was even presented to them i think that's probably hardened their attitude to it mm. they're look they're looking at a set of books that you know a, a company or i'm not sure how you describe the rfu but you know that their accounts last year were spectacular they you know produced record revenues they've no debt they've they sold newlands now they've ring fenced funds for club game but they will look at that and go right you've got some wiggle room and all these contracts that were announced last week, I mean, I presume they're legally binding. I don't think the RFU can force, I'm not sure how the RFU go about forcing the players to take a cut. They can't drop to a four-day week because they're they're full-time professional players. You can't be a sportsman for six days at, or for four days out of five. They're, they're seven-day-a-week employees mm. with short careers. Um, I know they want to protect 
the players who were on lower income. They did that with the, with the the pay the feral scheme, which was agreed between the union and the players' union. Um, you know, the, the players below any any employee, but the players below twenty five grand didn't take any sort of a, a cut. Whereas anyone over a certain threshold, I can't remember exactly what it was, mm. got fifty percent off their their cut off their salary on a on a um on a tiered basis the whole way up. And I, that seemed like a very fair way of going about it. Jacob Stockdale came out and said, look, we didn't want the lower paid employees. You know, he's on a national contract. He said they didn't want the lower paid employees to bear the brunt of this, that they were willing to do it. And they showed a lot of leadership in doing that. I think they'll come to some solution along those lines. Um, but I think there's a, that's going to be fairly interesting to watch on Wednesday, how far the RFU are willing to go and how how damaged the relations have gotten because it was a very close relationship between Ruby Players Ireland and RFU mm. um, where uh, how far they're willing to go in terms of helping the RFU with their, their own situation obviously Kira Medler will have looked at that looked at the books and made an assess a, a judgment based on that and um, we'll know a lot more I think after Wednesday but it's it'll be quite telling because the RFU have been preparing the ground for this in their public comments throughout the crisis Philip Brown has repeatedly said that their their income has fallen off a cliff, mm. and you know there's there's no arguing with that. They've no they've had no games, but they do have reserves. They do have um, significant land holdings. They do have assets. Um, they don't have any debts. They may have other ways of going about generating income. Certainly, rugby players Ireland may say, you know, what about this? Maybe they'll go to them with solutions, and the RFU might not like that. So it's going to be interesting to see whether they can come to some sort of arrangement because the deferral scheme ends uh, tomorrow. Okay. And there's no great difference in terms of negotiations here beyond just the amounts of money. I know you're saying the lower paid um, players will be protected, but just uh, national contracts and provincial contracts, these are all part of the same negotiations here with the IRFU. Yeah, so every member of the national and provincial staff has taken, a tw- uh, non-playing staff has taken a 20% cut and gone to a four-day week. They're trying to get the players to do the same, so that would apply to every player across the board in all four okay. provinces. and. The Ireland Sevens teams, um, the support staff, all that sort of stuff. So um, that's what's a, a play. And I think a flat 20% cut is something that the Rugby Players Ireland will object to because they want to protect the lower paid. And they also probably don't like to look at that 20% figure either. I think they want to bring that down. Or even for the highest earners. Well, I, I think maybe, I think that's that's all to be worked out. But yeah. I, I think they they would like to keep, you know, because they are, you know, they, they're, they're only earning that higher high figure for a short number of years i think that that's one of the points that they're, they're sticking to so it'll be like those contracts you know are, are, are inked you know i mean oh, the rfu may want to reset the the wage structure but it may they may have to wait a year or two until contracts expire and they start offering lower ones you know i mean mm-hmm. it's going to be like it's it, the players have played ball up to now but it, i think their position is hardened okay rory o'connor irish independent thanks so much rory appreciate it Cheers, Joe. talk to you later We'll be back to the rugby on Wednesday evening, obviously. In the meantime, short ad break, 22 minutes gone. Crystal Palace nil, Burnley nil in this evening's Premier League action. And in the League Two playoff, it's half time. And Northampton Town are 2 0 up against Exeter in that League Two playoff this evening. We'll take a short ad break. Jack McCaffrey is what we're talking about for the rest of this hour. Monday Night Rugby on Off the Ball with Vodafone, official sponsors of the Irish rugby team. Team of us. Everyone.